one zero zero. Like the Audi model. Like the clap. Hmm. Guys, can you, you're getting so much better at this. No, he's not. I've been pr- practicing. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, Audi 100. A car with a five-cylinder engine. Yeah. Championed by Ferdinand Piech. Does Psych. that mean? <laughs> does that mean that episode 100 of the Carmudgeon Show will be the long awaited, awaited slash lamented <laughs> slash, <the episode>? <laughs> <laughs> slash extortioned? Yeah, no, uh, no, it doesn't. It's not. This but is it, not the P episode. <laughs> there's a reason for it. We'll talk about that later. In this episode, however, we are talking about what are we talking about? Everything. Talked about. Lemons rally, vintage Mercedes Benzes, Bruno Sacco, uh, recent automotive acquisitions of oh, which God, there have been like kind of a lot. There's some pretty Oopsies. amazing. We bought we bought a car together. Yes, this means first time we've ever co-owned an automobile. First time I've ever co-owned. It. Why? What are you? <laughs> it takes a special kind of car to get me to buy only a portion of it because <laughs> it I'm be, that scared. It, of it has to be just heroically bad for Jason to only want half of it. Yeah. That's so scary. yeah, more uh, details about that anon. Um, but before we go on, I need to point out that the Car Mountain Show is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network, and Haggerty yes. is currently running a 60-day free trial on the Haggerty Drivers Club. Uh, you can sign up for the Haggerty Drivers Club. Think of it like I did. You did, oh, yeah. Well, so it can be part of your insurance, or it can be a standalone product. If it's a standalone product, it includes all of the same benefits, which <gasps> include roadside guaranteed flatbed roadside assistance, the magazine, which is I don't many, use that at all. Slash, I use it much too much. I'm a Derek has user. a lot of broken cars, and a lot, he uses I'm a power that. User. Uh, there is the award winning magazine. There are plenty of discounts on very cool stuff, including I use it for Grios Garage stuff because it's amazing. Really? Yeah, there's a lot of Wait, stuff. I've been paying full pop unnecessarily for griot's garage that blue spray i mean now 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 it sounds like we're sponsored by griot hey rich griot you want to sponsor us because you don't have to i'm just going to plug your stuff anyway great stuff anyway we'll talk about more of that later but there will be a link below or probably one of those things that are like up there maybe floating above his head where you can click on it and we'll get credit for it not like we're making any money on it like not gonna even give us a not even a cent i think not even a cent which makes you won't get fired and jason is doing his job and not getting fired by uh talking about (laughs) hackery's driver's club despite all the other horrible (laughs) shit that we're talking hey let's talk about rental car abuse we work for an insurance company uh this is great only on the Uh, convention show number 100 number 100 but not the PX episode. Stop it. Don't remind them. They're going to be very... They, they don't need reminding. They don't need reminding. <laughs> we will do it. God damn it. Some decade. All right. Cue the music. We're done. What is it, Jason? Hello. Hello. Weren't, you to, weren't you supposed to read something? Uh, read something. Oh, uh, yes. Um, Lucid had some mm-hmm. stuff mm-hmm. that they wanted us to, to share. Yep. Uh, so, yes. What did they say? Let me read here. Once upon a time, oh, no, wait. Uh, Every Carmudgeon listener knows about the Lucid Air, Mm -hmm. the longest range, fastest charging luxury electric car in the world. It's Mm -hmm. designed in California, assembled in Arizona, and Jason over there on your side of the screen uh, has made more than a few videos about its incredible performance. What you might not know about, however, is the special lease and finance offers available on 2023 models of the Lucid Air Touring and Grand Touring. Get a new lease on electric. Visit lucidmotors.com for offer details. Uh, I think that's all I that's have it? to say on that okay. subject. But anyway, yeah, yeah, like we've got a sponsor. Great. Mega exciting. Uh, is there anything else we needed to cover? No, I think that's it. Okay, splendid. Uh, then in that case, let's get back to the uh, original uh, episode. Excuse me. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yep, Thanks. No Thanks. Bye. Okay, see ya. Um, um, this is going to be very therapeutic. Um, what's happening in two hours? Uh, ah. I have, am, I'm going to unsocko myself slightly. De- slightly desocotization? Yeah, slight desocotization or similar. Uh, <laughs> my E320 sedan is ending on Bring a Trailer because I have maybe purchased, I think I've purchased three or acquired three Sako cars in the last... Uh, <clears throat> month i think we need to rename the podcast so hold on the purpose of you saying that is anyone who's watching if you want a x derek tam hyphen scott Sako car 
you could go have an E320 that's on Bring a Trailer, but it's ending in two hours from the time this episode debuts, provided that we actually get this episode out the door on time, which has not actually been the case every time recently. Yes, we had a couple of Tuesday episodes, but yeah, it's a sedan. It's an E320 sedan that's blue on blue that uh, will go away because the wagon arrived. But first, let's have an actual episode about number 100. Everyone, of course, will want to know whether this is the uh, Pie episode. It is not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I don't want to have to say it. Um, listen, listen, we want, let's make this very clear to our audience. We want to do the P episode as much as, or, and potentially more than you guys want to hear the P episode. I don't think so. I was threatened with riots last week. Oh shit, really? Yeah. This is the P episode. No, look, we want to do it right. And we just both have an, I'm in Miata land doing research on a revelation. There's a place Miata. in Italy called Miata land. Did you know that? No. It is a hotel in rural Italy, I shouldn't share this with people or it's going to be overrun, uh, but they have Miatas, like a collection of maybe 20 Miatas of various eras. And I think you can like rent them as part of your rent one as part of your Miata stay at Miata land. It's like a villa that is Miata themed villa hotel di Miata. in Italy. Yeah. Okay, I've been meaning funny. to go to Miata land, but okay. I just haven't gotten so around to it. I'm living <laughs> as opposed to staying temporarily in Miata land. Uh, and I just, we haven't had time to do this research. And so I'm sorry. I, on behalf of all Carmudgeons, I am sorry that we have not yet done sufficient research to give you the P episode that you deserve. I have started. I have some materials. I started too a couple years ago. Oh, when we started, the other thing we started was this. We just, I, we just went and looked. We started this podcast almost four years ago. Yeah, it was fall of nineteen. Pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. If you include our sort of casual hiatus schedule of like once every three months that we did in what year was that? Twenty. Well, prior to an infusion of enthusiasm by the Haggerty Podcast Network, we just yes. did it when we, we carmudgeoned when we had time. So it started out originally, if you remember, as I had a 15 minute timer or was it 20? 20. 20. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought like people have a 20 minute commute. You know, let's if just lucky or unlucky lucky or under, yeah. right? Let's just limit the show to 20 minutes. So we had a buzzer. We had the bullshit buzzer and then we had a timer set. Mm -hmm. And at the 20 minute mark, we wound it down. Yes. And much to my horror and surprise, people Everyone were like, was like more. Yeah. And we're like, are you sure? Really? These people want to listen to us talk for more than 20, 20 minutes. minutes. Okay. Yeah. They did. Yeah. And they still do. Uh, they, they absolutely still do. Our viewership numbers are amazing. So thank you to all of you who uh, view and or listen. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we kind of went through. So we've had three formats, right? So the beginning, yes. it was 20 minutes. But um, more importantly, it was in the ECME facility. facility. So you never knew what was going to be behind us, which was kind of cool. But it was also kind of annoying because you never knew who, you, who was going to walk through the background oblivious. Yes, and or now, just start some unexhausted car. Random, smoky, old pile of shit. That yes, would, and that would become even less coherent from the carbon <laughs> monoxide. What's worse? Was the carbon monoxide from the uncatalyzed old cars or was it us eating lunch and then recording? Yes. Because this is a common theme, if you haven't noticed. Yes, uh, and so the next phase was lockdown. Uh, lockdown. Lockdown was fun because I heard from everyone else who did podcasts, like, we can't do this. We, we want to do them in person. And so we came up with this, I'm going to say, relatively you, ingenious. You designed this scheme, and people I, are still like, wait, how did you do that? Yeah, it's really funny. I am a master of the ghetto rig. Like, I'm... You look at any of the videos that we produce you know, for Haggerty, and people really think we have budgets... The average guess that I get for the budgets is 10x what we actually spend. So we, I'm just, I love to find a cheap way of replicating. I'm a Panasonic buyer. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Panasonic makes stuff that's 95% or did for most of my life. Makes stuff that's 95% as good as like the real brands, um, but costs a tenth as much. They're like high-end brands, oh, to, high, be, to, yeah. to be so clear. Like, Not trying like, to think of like stereo stuff from back in the day, like Denon. And oh yeah, uh, it, well there was there's the the the, the Bang and Olufsen obviously which mm -hmm. is now everywhere but there were these brands that were uh, Nagasaki all the stuff you get Naka, Nakamichi Nakamichi um, and so you could just always go like I I just always buy Panasonic because I know their stuff is usually actually the stuff that's in the really high end stuff mm -hmm. um, and so I think of things the way Panasonic or Honda does right like, mm -hmm. you know find a way and so that one was 
I don't know. World the class heard. engineering for the it masses. Was. We took our iPhones, which both had the forward facing. You're going to share all this secret yeah, sauce? Not. No, we're not going back to lockdown. I hope. People have asked you subsequently, and you're like, I'm not telling. Yeah, I tell them. I, so. did curmudgeon, them curmudgeon listeners deserve Curm- to yeah. learn. Curmudgeon listeners can know that what we Even did if they was don't care. Some very loud, boisterous V8 just started outside. Yes, very civilized. <laughs> um, we, what I realized was the vertical resolution of the front facing iPhone camera was whatever, 480 by 720. And I'm like, oh, perfect. Seven, no, it was 720 tall. So yeah, we could wind up with seven, 780. God, lunch. We just ate and it was a big hamburger. I'm sorry. It was 780. So we could put two 780 tall images next to each other and we'd have a regular screen. So we would each in our houses sequestered away from one another because COVID was a real thing. Yes, uh, we think. Um, <laughs> and we would put like laptops up on a thing and duct tape. I used, uh, I used, use, use scotch tape. But I, I did use scotch tape, which is why periodically, I don't think we re- recaptured that many of them, but yeah, sometimes it would just fall down. Oh, yeah, it just taped up the iPhone to the monitor. Mm-hmm. And then on the laptop itself, we would do a Zoom call so we could see Have and hear each other. Yeah. But then their phone was just recording. It was just right. recording the front facing camera. Of one, one for each of us. One for each of us. And we, we each had two right side Apple ghetto headphones. So we'll have mm-hmm. an insert of this, obviously. But one of them, like my right ear was always the one that was just recording. Mm-hmm. So the microphone had fallen, would fall directly past my mouth. And the left one is so I could hear you and you could hear me. Yeah. And we would. And that's how we made it all. And then we'd send three files to the editor and some inserts and it would be yeah. a car margin. That's show. right. It was three files because it was your recording, my recording, and, and the then Zoom. the Zoom recording just in case something happened. Yeah, so that he um, could get the flow of the conversation yeah. and make sure that everything yeah. was synced. And sync it up, yeah. That's cool. So yeah, that was our engineering solution to deliver us, I don't know, how Do many, I actually wrote this down. What was so it? we did 46 episodes of the Carmudgeon Show on, on ECME. Um, yeah. And, and then I think 22 uh, of them. Twenty Episode 22 was the first lockdown episode, and 46 was the last lockdown. So we did more than half of those episodes down in episode. lockdown, which yeah. is pretty cool. On the ECB um, channel. Yeah. Yep. And now we're up to what? I don't even know. We're up to, well, this is 100. This so is 100. So, so we've more than done more than 50 of them on, uh, on the Haggerty. Haggerty channel. On the new Carmudgeon show. Yeah, but it was used, used to be a lot of disgruntlement uh, because it'd be like three months before between episodes. Not, not always, but occasionally. Usually. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah towards, was, towards the well, end. Well, we didn't have, to, I mean, you know, not a priority for either one of us. We have real jobs. Yeah. Or you have a real job and I play with cars. No, Wait my job is to play with cars your, your as well. Your job is more fun than mine. Although periodically it involves paperwork, which we don't like. Um, Me too, every time I run, borrow someone, some, uh, run oh, someone, b- borrow a car and say, we will return it to you at least in a shoebox, even yeah. if it's not a car anymore. We'll return all the pieces we, we can find. We don't do that. We no, return cars in condition often better than we found them. That's true. You have to do some light restoration in anticipation. I did quite a detail on your, on your mirror when we did it for the Revelations episode. And I did a quickie and then Tim McNair came in, our friend, the detail god, and he, he did the engine compartment Yeah, for his own episode. And then but, uh, I've had to do some restoration on cars also, yeah. The best was the Saab 900 episode. The 900 came in, it was a little bit messy. And then the 99 showed up on, because we had a nine, nine, 900 turbo and then a 99 turbo. And it was like 11 or 11.30 at night after like a 15-hour day, this tow truck finally shows up with the 99 turbo on it. And the tow truck driver refused to get in the car because it was so gross. <laughs> um, and so we go to back it out. It has no brakes at all. Um, and you, I think the shift lever wasn't attached. So there was no way to, st- and, and no e-brake. So I got in the car and I was like, I don't, I, this smells very, very bad. And <laughs> we, we get in a it, hazmat suit. It, we get it down and then push it back into the studio. And the owner, first of all, the car looked like it had been washed repeatedly with a Brillo pad. And then the owner wanted to shine it up and used an entire can of WD-40 on it. And oh, so you a, couldn't touch it. You'd slide right off. And it stunk. Yeah. So we came in the next morning to start filming and the studio was so full of WD-40 smell that we both got like nauseous and pushed the car back outside. We had to rinse it off with like a degreaser. Um, but that car was nasty. Nasty. It pretty good on camera yeah, right with a soft light box i mean that's our job right yeah, job is to flattering. make the car look perfect and when i borrow cars from people for that show i always tell them like it doesn't have to be perfect it, it'd be nice if it's clean sometimes they're not um just because we're begging people for their cars and you know they're you like i don't have time to get. clean it yeah. yeah um but that one that car was 
literally junk, dragged out of a junkyard. Mm. I was told it ran. Uh, and Well, it I, ran when it was new. <laughs> uh, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, hopefully. It did something, right, to get that filthy. Anyway, uh, so here we are, episode 100, mm-hmm. in our lovely third format, which is this studio is gorgeous. Fantastic. Do you think there's a benefit to having cars in the background? Yeah, I think it adds visual interest, a sense of dynamism. It dates a certain moment, right? If the cars change and you know there was that time has passed. Do you think I need to knock that wall down and like sort of... Like, well, then we're going to be looking outside. Yeah, but then we can sort of like have a car hanging from a cherry picker. We could just get, get, put a 118th model. That is, a, I don't know if you noticed, that's, that's a, a TV screen. screen. We yeah. could have episodes of the Carmudgeon Show playing in the background while oh, we're putting the Carmudgeon Show. That would be a mindfuck. Uh, okay, so that was the retrospective <laughs> on 100 episodes. Uh, what be- was your... F- Hold on, before we go away from the I- retrospective, what's your favorite... Do you, do you have a favorite moment? I don't. I mean, I like... I know there are definitely like memorable moments usually when fluids come out of my yeah, nose when you hole. Threw up from the Yeah, from so that was the no, to me it was your absolute so your laugh is contagious beyond belief because you know this sort of if I had to describe Derek to somebody, it would be like, okay, he's very he's the vocabulary of a ninety four year old dame from the nineteen twenties. And he's very, if it were a car, it would be like a Mercedes six hundred grocer. Yes, exactly. Very understated, very together. Somber, And then when you start to laugh, when you genuinely, not a giggle, but when you break and go hysteric, hysteric, (laughs) hysteric, Derek? When you go hysterical, you go 15 octaves up and you have this hilarious screaming laugh. And to me, the best one wasn't the Trump comment that made you throw up in your nose. The one, it was the Pontiac endurance test. I think you were hysterical. I also was weeping. I was genuinely weeping. Um, so yes, people still talk about the Pontiac endurance test. That is probably something at some point we should do. I did at one point look for a Pontiac Sunfire, um, Mm -hmm. on Craigslist that we could buy for some hundreds of dollars, but I couldn't find one. Uh, but I guess I should probably have a saved Craigslist search so that we can attempt to replicate the Pontiac endurance test. It passed. Yeah. I mean, it was a rental car. It was new at the time. But that reminds me, we should still do the Mike episode. So Mike. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mike was my best friend who passed away now six and a half years ago. And he was. The cause (laughs) of the Pontiac endurance test. The, he designed that test. Um, By virtue of him trying to kill a rental, rental car. Like he wanted it executed. Um, But Mike is behind almost all of my most he's no longer on this planet so he can't get arrested the worst things i've ever done as a human being he's been there and instigated most of them Mm -hmm. including buying half of the cars i own i mean he was there for the scirocco the e30 and the 2316 Mm -hmm. uh, plus i'm sure plenty others so i should now that he's gone um i think i should start writing down all the stories of just all the fuckery that we got into including trying desperately and failing to blow up a pontiac rental car Yes, and that episode we was not the rental car abuse episode, which yeah, is a separate different. episode. That was about you and a Macan. Yes, uh, but we also talked, I think, about a a Tercel or something yeah, that, that you jumped thumbnail. and returned in a shoebox or no, something. No, that thing drove two hundred miles back, <laughs> sideways, crabbing down the road. But yeah, that, <laughs> from that, the bent chassis. That was a bad one. But the Pontiac endurance test was part of the. Uh, gone, it was the episode was called "Gone in Two and a Half Seconds." I don't even remember why we're talking about it during that episode, but it was supposed to be an episode about how fast the M8 was, and of course we ended up talking about Pontiac Sunfire or whatever it was. Sunfire. Sunfire. Yeah. Sundance was the predecessor. Sundance was a Plymouth. Sunbird. Oh, Plymouth. Sunbird. The, yes. A lot yes. of sun. Um, yes. Okay. So that is my favorite moment. So uh, it's a, we'll revisit the Pontiac endurance test and all of the other Mike stuff in a future episode. You were going to say, I'm sorry. Uh, what else has happened you. lately? Was I transitioning the, the dog leg? Uh, I've acquired a dog leg uh, Mercedes station wagon. Which arrived. So we talked about that in the last episode. We think... This Derek's 124T model E320 is the only dog factory dog leg manual transmission. Some people said maybe Datsun 510 because they did make station wagon Datsun 510s. Yeah, I hadn't uh, seen any comments. And there about. was another comment where someone made something where I was like, oh, interesting point. There was another interesting point, which is uh, the current Bronco seven speed. Oh, yes. Uh, has technically it's a dog leg. It's uh-huh. a crawl. It's a, you know, six speed plus a crawl gear. So technically that's a seven speed. But okay. um, you showed up. You, I, you were at the port 
picking up your wagon and I yes. made you drive by my house. Yes. We actually went by your house on the way there because the traffic was so bad that we ended up taking a different route, the uh, the old reach around route to uh, to the port. Uh, and so we just traced, retraced our steps on the way back so that we could uh, stop by with the, the new wagon. Uh, that you have won. I mean, I have a really hot little E30 wagon. Mm. Really hot. You won. That's you think a so? purple E-Class manual. Okay, yeah. let me, let's me let put it this way. Once you swap a 3.6 liter mm-hmm. the C36 AMG motor in there with the manual, you will have one. Yeah, one of our listeners has enthusiastically agreed to come assist and provide the motor, which is reportedly freshly rebuilt. Well, He always to- sends us... Uh, Matt always sends us notes when we've gotten things wrong about Mercedes Benzes because he knows more than both of us combined apparently about these cars. Matt, you need to get laid. <laughs> no, he's. Uh, I, I, I believe he's in. A, well, actually, I have no idea. I'm not going to speculate about his relationship status. It doesn't However, matter. However, if he knows more than you and me combined, he is not satisfying partying. his partner. Yes. <laughs> um, so he's going to he's going to come join us reportedly around the time of Car Week, and, and I told him to carry on, but he's driving out in a. Sp- a C126 that has a 113K swap. So that's a, sup- a, tr- a shit. supercharged E55 engine. Which is a 5.4 uh, liter. Yes, let's be very clear. exactly. Uh, into a C126 for Car Week. And then he said maybe you can stay for a few days afterwards and uh, we can put a 3.6 liter in it. But even before I, the I'm, 3.6. I'm sorry, though. I'm sorry. He needs to come before... I. Sorry, sorry that I have to dictate his schedule. He needs to come the week before car week so we can use my new Ben Pack lift, lift and swap in that 3.6 liter so you can use a 3. Point, you got to then get an E360 badge <laughs> for the back of your wagon and use that as your Pebble but a, Beach. Well, I can drive it with a 3.2 during that no, week. No, you can't. Uh, well, the other thing is I think he's going to be madly rushing to finish the car that he's displaying at Car Week, and so he's p- perhaps not available prior. I don't know if everybody in the car industry the week before Car Week is like, ah, shit, my hair's on fire because i got to get this thing finished, and they're like, I haven't slept in a week, and, you know. He's forgiven if he's just finishing his own engine swap, but if he's yes. not, he needs to come out the week before, and we will get your car done, because I think a three points... How many horsepower is a 3.6? 270 ish plus or minus i think they were it depends on like ps versus horsepower it's 268 272 somewhere in there okay. it's 270 so a 270 it's horsepower dogleg manual five speed purple wagon yes and it's with, sport line with standheizung yeah well the stand standheizung is in the box yeah, but, but we'll we have put that in we, we have, have it we have two months so for uh, those who don't know in germany there was in, i guess in all of europe but there's a in the german market there's a thing called standheizung which is you like see it in english heat? described as um, auxiliary, auxiliary heat. heater Usually made by Vibasto. Vibasto, um, which is the sunroof. Like sunroofs sun yeah. and Standheizung. So there, um, I had a 190E 2.0 automatic as my daily driver for many, many years, 100 years ago. And it had Standheizung. And they have a little panel, on, panel the, yeah. on the center console on that car. Um, and you, There's a great YouTube video of the guy doing the full Standheizung um, routine. So he walks up to the car. It's covered in snow, and he's mm-hmm. like, put opens the car and t- turns pushes the button that's turn that starts the Standheizung. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of the video, there's like five minutes of him just getting snow off the car while the Standheizung is doing. So its what thing. it is is the little gas furnace that's this sort of. You is know, it a reciprocating? What's inside of it? I it, think it's just a little heat exchanger that but burns it, like, gas. But how does it? Is it a turbine it's it's not it sounds reciprocating like a turbine, but i think what you're hearing is the yeah it must be a some sort of turbine i don't it's know spinning. I it's it. not reciprocating but all you used to hear when i so there's a little the panel you hit a flame button and you'd hear and it would sit there and scream for a little while and it had a little exhaust pipe and steam and muffler stuff would come out and well it wasn't all that much muffler when on mine if you back in the day mine has a muffler on it that's that would make sense. And what it did was burn gasoline straight out of the tank to preheat coolant. And I think some of them had oil. Mm. Um, but what it would also do in my 190, and this is a factory install, was it would turn the uh, the the inside HVAC fan on low and it would engage an electric water pump. So it would pump the, the coolant through and warm the, heater the core. coolant. Yeah. And heat the inside of the car so you didn't have to scrape ice but also you'd start the car and boom coolant was at normal temperature mm-hmm. and when i used to walk walk to the bus stop for school in the morning in germany and night this is 19 it also has a timer f- function it has a clock in it yeah so you could set it to come on at whatever time so you know all the germans would leave for work at exactly precisely 652 and so it's you know 641 
they would have their Steinheizen going and I'd be walking to school and there'd be little steam clouds coming from the front right fender of all these old Mercedes. Not old, they were new at the time. And just, yeah. all the cars would make noise. And I heard it was illegal in the U.S. for two reasons. Number one, for emissions, because they did not have, have to put a catalyst on your yeah. Standheizung. Uh, and number two, because of the risk of somebody starting a Standheizung in a garage, mm. which would, would could potentially... Could, I guess you could start a car in a garage, too. Well, that's why Germans for so long were so opposed to a remote remote start. Mm. Uh, it took. I talking, remember talking to BMW and Mercedes product planners about this. Germany would not let them have remote start. Mm. Uh, and they're like, hey, this is just not a luxury feature. This is on every GM product and every Chrysler product. And they're like, why do you need this? You could get someone. And they're like, you have Standheizung, asshole. <laughs> like, same yeah, thing. Yeah. Yes, but this is much more efficient. Well, we're American. We don't care about efficient. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, anyway, so you have a Standheizung. Yeah, it's a factory equipped, Standheizung car. Potentially and... 270 horsepower rear wheel drive. Yes. Five-speed dogleg manual purple wagon. I'm sorry, you Yeah, went. with the Recaro sports seats and the faster steering box, which is a fun phrase because it's a fast box. version of a the least sporty type of steering you could have and the sports suspension. <laughs> hey, E39 uh, M5 had a steering box. Yes, and so. it is a benchmark of steering quality. Yeah. <laughs> or no, s- not. <laughs> um, uh, and it's a slick top also. I personally like sunroofs but slick tops are always cooler i think that and it's got mono blocks on it and infrared locking oh yes and the the idiot i'm sorry the fine gentleman slash financial moron mental yes. midget who did that restoration on that car had to have lost well yeah he spent twenty eight thousand euros in parts alone to do the restoration every bolt is gorgeous yeah you can't drive that car i'm going to you can't it'll be fine you can you can drive it but only for the sake of like enjoying the car that the car is really really nice yeah um, i was uh, very pleased to see it and so it three months or whatever it was about in the end of february and it's now scene, right? june yes um but when i saw the pictures of the underside and got a sense of the amount of effort he put into it i was like i think this thing's pretty, gonna be pretty cool yeah because it's First got all, all this stuff german. you could never get here right. it's a german restoration unlike your your cosworth mercedes which you also bought mm-hmm. in europe but it was from, an italian yeah italian job and the car is originally a swiss car so yeah, uh you know, well maintained throughout its life. Amazing. So amazing. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. I'm very pleased with that. And uh, went to the port in it to collect the other Saco car that I spontaneously purchased uh, last oh, week. Oh, the, the car that brought you to the port. Yes. Was your. Uh, I did. Buy, so last episode, I was like, I need a W140 in this episode. <laughs> What, I, what era is this? Your this is your uh, plutocratic, plutocratic years. Plutocratic. Yes, my plutocratic years. I bought a W140. Uh, it is a configuration that I honestly dislike. Uh, it's it's uh, Jewish racing gold, as you call it. Yeah. Uh, smoke silver with a parchment interior, and it's a 420, not a 500. Uh, so spec. I bought. I uh, yes, Peasant I bought plutocrat. the yes. Uh, the my um, plutocracy bonus has <laughs> was not as large as I was yeah, expecting. The economy is just not. Yes, well in this here. economy, I had to go for the small small one. V8. Uh, no, I mean, the thing was uh, really cheap for her. Pr- price per pound. I calculated this car cost less than $2 a pound, uh, which is uh, compares favorably with most produce. Uh, fair, <laughs> fair enough. But not bananas. Um, so, yeah, it's a one-owner car. I bought it from the, the daughter of the original owner, and it has 50,000 miles, and it's spectacularly, like... I thought that the W140 was going to feel like a larger uh, E-Class, but it, it feels altogether different to me. Like the quality of like isolation and ride quality and civilizedness and just comfort, and it's all super next level. We were talking about that, that car was a tank, and the idea yes. that Princess Diana died in one of them is just a shocking thought when you drive it because you really well, do she was feel, unbelted right and that was you feel invincible in that car yes. um and she was as you do in a current s class um but she you know the crazy thing is they hit that post in the tunnel on the front right corner so by all means the the most at the, risk at <laughs> occupant risk, <laughs> occupant was the guy in the front right seat and he is the only one who survived the accident because he's the only one who was belted yeah she would have never died if she had her seatbelt on um, it was her aorta ripping out from her heart when she hit the the back of the seat in front of her. Um, and that's, that is the, I, I call that the princess Diana S class to people who don't know chassis codes and whatever, but it's, that's the sort of defining feature of that car is just, it felt like you could not die in it. Yeah. Um, it is an engineering marvel yeah. to be sure. And really impressive piece of equipment, uh, but complex yeah. for sure. 
a lot of wiring, soft closed doors, which have their own pneumatic actuators and air pump and just, you know, the electric I'm rear view. I'm not that afraid of 140s. I mean, I'm not either. They're built to high standards. 600s, I would be. The V12s. They're I not. I mean, supposedly those are pretty gur- durable cars, that engine. It's just access is a pain. Right. But the engine apparently is... It's the air suspension and the uh, ADC. Uh, they have convert. ADS, yes. ADS. Uh, adaptive damper, mm-hmm. adjustable ride height, right. suspension, self-leveling in the back. Uh, yeah, there's a little more complexity. The ADS system is a little bit scary to yeah. me. It's a... I don't know. Was the ADS still not... Uh, a, it's not wasn't ABC no, yet. No, it's back to ADS. body control I'm scared to death of. Yes. But I think R129 as V12s had ABC. Um, that would be news to me. Then I'm wrong. Two thirties. You know what? The, your, well, I'm not, what's his name, uh, Matt? Your, yeah, your yeah Matt can tell us, us yeah. where they're... Wh- what hey, the, Matt, stop not having sex and tell us what... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, if I had to guess, I would say that it, the, there's probably ADS, which is the hydraulic system. And we, we know someone who has a 600. It's a late 600, and it has ADS. Mm-hmm. And he cycles it every time he drives the car just to exercise the system. And I think that that's probably a good practice is to keep those systems going. Anyway, we have now, of course, during the 100th episode, fulfilled the promise of talking about Sacco era cars. As usual, before we transition to a topic that's not Bruno Sacco, his 90th birthday is November. Oh, I thought. What did, you, what did you think I was going to talk about? Keep that, no, no, keep going. His 90th birthday is in November. Yes. And uh, we thought we should celebrate by having some kind of Sacco Mercedes get together. We need to have 90 Sacco cars all together in one place. In well, I'm well on my way to owning 90. Oh, I don't have to supply them all myself. No, but I really do think we should have an entire selection of every body style uh, that was available in a Sacco car in Smoke Silver. Mm, yeah, <laughs> because we're getting pretty close on there. I know. I don't like that color, but here we are. We, we. Just... I never. It was never my choice either. But all my cars tend to be JRG. Yeah. Um, I thought you were going to bring up something else. Oh, which is that the, the a car. The other <laughs> the car that we jointly purchased. I have never jointly purchased a car before. Oh, really? But I'm so scared of this thing that I'm glad that I only own a portion of it. Yes. So this is another one. Thanks. This is your fucking fault. Another uh, Carmudgeon yeah. listener, in mm-hmm. fact, sent us a link to a car that I thought you were kidding about saying that you wanted to buy. And I just showed you the... Shit, we just double just, buffed each other. I, just, I showed you the the uh, the Facebook Marketplace ad for this thing. Just being like, ha ha, isn't this funny? Here's one for sale. And now we freaking own it. Not technically. The deposit has been sent. Okay, we sent a deposit and, and we're looking there's at documentation. Flights. And yeah, we're looking at flights to... So we purchased, thanks to that Rover V8 episode, I said, and I found the video after, so now we have the insert of the video. Oh, yes, of the one that yeah. you used to drive when you were so in high school. in high school, and I came back for the summers to the U.S., and I drove my friend Alex's parents' uh, gold, that was more of a gold, two-syllable, mm-hmm. two-syllable gold uh, Rover. They had a, I think this one was an 81. Their first, this was an 80 in the front. Did I tell you the story where they yes, had a red yes, Rover, right? The, yes. the crash and the whole thing. All right. Yes. So anyway, I drove this one all summer every year and have not driven one since 1993. I'm not sure I've seen one in person. An SD one. Uh, in since 1993, but Derek asshole follower on fucking Instagram had to be a dick and send us the listing. And now we have probably to own it. a 1980. Rover and SD1. it's in Moderately deep Canada. It's Very, in Edmonton. It's outside of Edmonton, yeah. Mm. So now we have to go figure out how to go get it. And drive it back and import it. And <laughs> it might be California registrable. It apparently, I, w- reading between the lines, we don't really know all that much about it, but reading, reading between the lines, I think it might actually have originally been a California car and then converted two kilometers on the speedometer. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're going to find out. But it is injected because a lot of those things were carbureted. But for the California, because this is the same engine as we discussed in the episode that was used in the Triumph TR8, which was available for sale new in California and came with fuel injection. Uh, and this plenum looks exactly the same as a TR8. So uh, my hope hypothesis, although I'd have no idea how fun it is or easy it is to smog a TR8, but hyp- the car is not going to be dismissed outright by the state of California as deeply I forbidden. Think it, uh, right, and especially because I think this one was originally purchased in California. The owner, mm. the owner is the the original. So the original owner uh, passed away, and this is his grandson who's selling the car. And he said he wasn't sure whether his grandfather had bought it in the U.S. or not. The, there are thirty eight, no, forty eight, forty eight thousand kilometers on indicated. the on the kilometer speedometer but there's a sticker on the door that said the speedometer was replaced at four four thousand miles Mm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and he had said, yeah, my dad and my grandfather could have bought it in the U S. And so now we're going to find out one where I'm sure there's some sort of like, I can just call Rover and ask them, Hey, where did this SD one get it's sold? It's going to forward you around the world to all of the owners. It's, it's going to forward you from England to Germany, right. to Germany. And then who owned Rover after that? I don't know. Uh, I think it ended up with the Chinese. So the, the oh, phone call is going to yeah. get forwarded yeah. around yeah. the world. Please continue to hold it. <laughs> well, we, oh, oh, oh. As we connect all you calls to are answered in the order in which they're received. You are called a number eight. Point six million. No, um, no, or caller number one. one. <laughs> no one Your estimated rate wait time is six hundred years. Uh, yeah, it's a cool color. Mm -hmm. It's a little rusty. A little bit rusty, but you know, but apparently isn't? functions. Yes, we're all. We had a PPI rusty. done. Another Instagram, Instagram, Instagram thing. Yeah. I went to go yeah. look at it. Drove it. Said it drove great. Clutch yeah. catches high. I'm scared to death. Yeah, that means the clutch is going to uh, make it all the way to uh, Calgary from Edmonton. I don't. Maybe. I, I don't know. So maybe we should ask in the comments, maybe our Canadian thing. How do you how do you get a Canadian AAA policy as a non Canadian? I think that maybe Haggerty so Haggerty will definitely do an a, an endorsement for, for international insurance. use. Yeah. And they might have roadside also. I think we might be Haggerty able to do does, Haggerty on. Roadside. Hey Siri, remind me when I get home to call my own company and ask about <laughs> Canada. <laughs> um, so like my own employer yeah no we'll get that's what i'm, I'm what i'm nervous about is a 1500 mile road trip in a 38 year old car that which was widely panned for being of low quality when it was new hideously unreliable but but it wasn't like it was the electronics it was the door like the door actuators and the windows and the structure they're prone to rust well yeah there's a Whatever. The electrics, the electrics can't be good. It's British. No, they can't. No, that was what I'm saying. It was. I remember John, the, the Alex's dad, would like try to open the door, and as soon as he would touch oh, the latch, yes. the, it would ground we'd itself and lock. This. You know, there were just like other stupid shit like that. The only thing that ever really broke is I might have accidentally broken the prop shaft, the center drive shaft bearing, but I did a horrible burnout in it and had axle hop from hell. Mm, wait, so um, yeah, it's a, it's a live rear end, maybe with DD on, maybe not. I it's a live rear end. That's all I remember. Mm -hmm. um, but the second. The second I, I, yeah, I, as soon as we did this, I went on the YouTubes and I was like, Rover SD1 3500 sound, and I flooded my basement. Oh, oh yes. my God. The sooner we can get glass packs on this thing, the yeah. better. Yeah, yeah because it's it not sounds... the type of car that either of us is really predisposed to own, really. Yeah. Like these sort of uncivilized American V8s, cam and block, you know, redneck type cars. I mean, the cars. joke, the only V8s I've ever owned have been a Mercedes 6.9 and a Mercedes C43. Yeah. So two Mercedes V8s. This is going to be my first American V8. First push rods? Uh, hold on. Was your Isuzu? Isuzu was overhead cam. Okay. Overhead disappointment. Um, I think it Maybe. had a belt. I don't remember. It had to be overhead cam. I don't. Beats me. A 2.3 liter Isuzu pup. Does it, was it overhead cam? Probably. Film at 11. I think it was. Um, yeah. So maybe your first push rods. Could be my first push rods. Definitely my first British engined British car. Well, American engine, British car. So I have two British cars, neither which of which a have genre. a British engine. Yeah, which is a genre that's common, British cars with non-British engines. I mean, Rover did enough engineering to that engine that you could argue it's slightly British, but the original design certainly yeah. was done at uh, Buick, of course. Buick. And you do not see the Ferrari connection on the front end of this car? I mean, the shape of the turn signals is the yeah. same, and it's kind of slopey. But I think to call it a Daytona is maybe a little bit of a stretch. I mean, it's Daytona inspired. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. It looks more like a Daytona than a Gelendewagen. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, that helmet. <laughs> yeah. No, I think they are spectacularly beautiful cars. I can't wait. I'm so excited about this. I'm scared right. to death. Well, we have to figure out when we're going to get up there. Car Mudgeon Show might take a month hiatus as we try to should unfuck we, this whole situation. Should we, this thing back. We'll be on the side of the road recording a Car Mudgeon Show. Well, plug your shot out of the side of the... I don't know. I don't know. It's scary. But what could possibly go wrong? It's a rover. What could possibly go right? Yes. No, I'm I'm hoping for a 15 hour... Uh, 20, hold on. 25, 25 hour. hour. Yeah. 25 hours of nonstop enjoyment. I'll sing or amusement um, yeah, at something. a minimum. Look, it's a look. My thing is the car is a reasonable amount of money, 
And people spend... Especially when you split it. <laughs> right. Well, exactly. People spend thousands and thousands of dollars on experiences, right? So you spend, you know, like $1,000 on a concert ticket. I don't <sighs> do that kind of stuff. Mm. I just tried to get tickets for... There was something recent where I was like, oh, I'm going to go get see this concert. What the fuck was it? And tickets started at 1200 bucks. And I'm, like, I'm not spending $1,200 for two hours of listening to something that I could listen to on, you know, a stereo. Um, and so I think a couple thousand bucks for an adventure to own something that might or might not be worth that amount of money when it gets home, I don't care, is cool. So now we just got to get cheap flights. Hey, if you're looking to sponsor a podcast and you own an airline, we need to get to Edmonton, Alberta. I think Air Canada is probably the path we'll end up with. But, but anyway, um, we will, uh, yeah, the more to come on the rover, maybe. So to celebrate the 100th it, episode, hold on, the week for tax purposes. To celebrate the 100th episode of the Carmudgeon Show, the Carmudgeon Show has purchased a Rover SD1. <laughs> right. Yeah. Tax um, right off. Come on, okay. it's half price. Tax deductible. Oh my God. Tax uh, deductible, deductible shit box purchasing. Yes. We'll go to Canadian Tire. It'll be great. It'll be great. So we can Plus buy a mixer. A big trunk. We can fit all kinds of spare parts. I don't think I have ever even touched a Rover SD1. This is awesome. I And it's 1993. So this, hold on. This 93? 93 was the last time you, I drove one. It's oh, 30, 30 years. years since you drove one. And the car is oh God, remember when old. old people would be like, hey, she passed away 30 years ago. 30 years. I'm that old fucking person now. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's been 30 S years since I've driven a Rover SD1. SD1. Um... I, that's the only i'm just trying to think about the cars i've experienced that engine in apollo range rover i think it's only i never never with a manual or range rovers never came with a manual because it's not in the u.s but you could get them overseas in a manual with a with a three and a half liter mm -hmm. three nine yeah three five and three nine huh oh all the defenders why don't we swap a US three nine into this thing we could we could put a four two and we could m build it out to five liters five okay I am like glass packs, five liter cam, like big lopy cam. Blah, 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 blah. The thing is the car looks so dignified. It's a big luxury. So if you're going to do that, then you may as well put like a, damn it, your computer's I know I got a new computer and strike. I reset the whole. Your computer is um, it's, it unionized. Does, <laughs> it it does unionized. a screen grab. Well, what that means is the end of our hundredth episode. Oh. I don't know. I don't know what time we started this. I don't either. Uh, can we not. get a time hack, Paulo? How how he deep just, are we into this? He just this gave us a nudge, like I don't care. Okay, uh, are you done? It's been um, forty minutes. We have to talk we also, to also about the rally and the, the racing. Yes, that's right. You did lemons the, a couple weekends, I a few did. weekends ago. I did. I gotta say, so we. I was the, how I was thinking about mentioning this is you did another one of your famous rallies this mm -hmm. this weekend where you put together great roads and a bunch of great people and I didn't and mediocre cars I think that this was a funny one because the in the spirit of lemons maybe to some extent normally there's at least some expensive cars you know some asshole shows up in a Porsche 911 That's or you. something like yeah. that yeah I know uh, and this one. Uh, so one of our friends joined a little bit uh, through the first day and when he pulled up to see our motley crew of cars he's like wow i brought the expensive car because i have a bmw e39 530i and it's you know maybe ten thousand dollar car <laughs> and he's like i have got the expensive car because yeah everyone is driving shit boxes this time so this is as usual you start on friday and everyone mm -hmm. meets friday morning drives all day friday all day saturday and then sunday everyone kind of drives a little bit more and heads home I didn't participate for two reasons. Number one, uh, uh, number one, I had two crazy weekends in a row. The first weekend I was in Italy the, for that Villa Desta amazingness. The second weekend was a 24 hours of lemons race. Mm -hmm. um, I am still very injured for, let me say this, for the purpose of workers' compensation insurance. <laughs> I am very injured still from that GR Corolla shoot. And that's now three months and a week ago. I still have this friggin brace on i cannot grab anything i cannot use my right arm apparently tennis elbow which is actually e-brake elbow in this case is really fucking painful and really is not going so you away. did a lemons race having to shift like that I mean, it's, uh, yeah yeah <laughs> i mean the problem is i think it's not getting better because i I'm, i need to use it like it's not it's like a I've, shifting arm i may I have gotta to drive just, around in the chrysler minivan only e-golf thank you oh, yes yes um or i have a bmw i7 at the moment but i'm too busy punching the screen and that fucking thing out of frustration oh, that's gonna um, exacerbate yeah. your tennis elbow yeah, from... i keep doing it but anyway so um 
So two busy weekends. And then you told me you were taking the nine the, the, the 964. Yes, I like, was going to. Yeah, so Derek's got a fast Porsche. The car that I bought and built specifically for this type of event is Beatrice, who hasn't moved, really, in the 13 or 15 months since the last one when I broke the windshield, broke a headlight, blew two shocks, lost half the exhaust, and destroyed the throttle throw throw bearing. bearing. Yes. Well, I didn't have time to get it done correctly. And you're like, well, I'm taking a Porsche 964. And I'm like, shit, what am I going to be able to keep up with you? And, and I thought, if I take the little blue wagon, I'm going to break a windshield, which is brand new and 800 bucks. And if I take the Mercedes, I'm going to fuck up the front end. If I take the Scirocco, I'm going to fuck up the front end. I'm just not going. What did you take? A friggin' Miata. I didn't know that was your thinking. I assumed you were too busy to come. I kind of was. But the deal breaker was that Beatrice wasn't ready. Like, I don't want to risk any of the other cars you know, I, could, I thought I could take the cabbie, but I have that on non-sticky tires on purpose. And I just, annoyingly, out of the 10 cars that I have, none of them were ideal for this route. Mission, yes. Um, and instead I, I showed up in the Miata. You oh, all showed up it? in Miatas. There was a Miata, Miata, Miata Z3, which is a, bad, you know, a, a morbidly obese Miata, and another Z3. Yeah, and, and then, the 530i. And then a five, an E39 530i. Oh, and then a 500e that also didn't do the rally. Yet. Yes, but anyway, it was fun to see you guys. It was always fun. Yes. But we did like 14 seconds of motoring on the last day together. My brakes were on fire. Oh, yes. You did yeah. set your brakes For on the fire. record, do not upgrade your brakes uh, pads to Bosch Quiet Cast. I did. So the problem with the wagon is I have Beatrice, so I don't need crazy aggressive brake pads on it, and I don't want to clean the wheels. So I put. You have basket weaves, which are just oh, infinite nightmares. cleaning. And they're brand new basket weaves, and I want to keep them looking brand new. So. I had these Bosch pads on it and oh my God, I mean, it was dangerous. So I had to back off quite a bit. And then we came to a sudden stop at the top of a mountain road. We weren't even going downhill. We were going uphill and we just like went down like one little curve downhill and there was, the road was closed for construction. And I almost, I was in the process of turning around to go back because I thought the car was going to catch on fire. There was that the much were smoke. smoking that much. Yeah. So I'm going back to factory pads and I'll just have to deal with the Cleaning. dust and whatever. Um, but yeah. the whole thing was a real reminder that as wonderful as those rallies are, nothing comes close to lemons. Mm -hmm. well it, it helps to have a car that can absolutely walk all over everything else it our cars our race teams cars do not walk over everything they fucking jog sprint and just it's ridiculous yes. it's like wearing i've said i think i've said this before on the podcast it's like wearing a superhero cape yeah. so we have an e28 and an e36 both of which have large m50s in them um and our team captain and the owner of those cars is bill arnold who is nationally known for his work on bmws and for winning target newfoundland four times for doing really well in one lap and the motherfucker knows how to build a car knows how to set it up and he knows how to race and so we had randy popes racing with us on the team which cost us three penalty laps which was annoying because if you do the math of how much faster randy was on average per lap versus me he would have had to drive and i'm not a pro driver right so it's a pro driver penalty lap he would have had to drive the entire 14 and a half hours of racing to, to make catch up just to difference. catch up right so that was a little bit i'd like to say unfair but you but, are faster than ever than the average yeah, but i'm not a pro and i'm not i wasn't the fastest guy there my fastest lap was the 10th fastest lap of the of the whole 120 car group so i'm not that fast and plenty of other people were faster than me and there are plenty of other like semi-pro drivers in there Oh, so we started out with a three-lap penalty, which is really almost. Well, you just 15 have to get minutes. a mustache dis disguise for uh, Randy next time. Dude, it's his voice. He, he gets busted yeah. from his voice. He's got that, yeah. you know. Hey, Jason, like that really distinctive, soft yeah. voice. Uh, so we started in dead fucking last because we had a fifteen-minute basically penalty, uh, and we were in second place overall when when, <laughs> when Bill got in the car. <laughs> Uh, and the deal is Bill is a Bill in a China shop. Like he's, mm. he's a little bit tough on the Swift, equipment, but hard on equipment. Yeah. Uh, and he lost the right rear wheel around he didn't a completely lose it. Well, it no longer was attached to the car by anything other than gravity. So he broke all the stud. Well, it's, it's really not his fault. Stud snapped around a right hand downhill, very high G corner where right where you go to like, it's the crossover from the two mile to the three mile. So you kind of go down a hill Actually, we have it on video. I'll get a clip of it. But you, you're coming down the hill and you sort of transition from a, you know, a very steep downhill to level. And that nudge is a really pretty significant nudge. Uh, and the wheel snapped off. And he was like, ah, shit, what do I do? And it was only like 50 minutes left in the, in the day. This is day one. 
Uh, and he thought, well, I lost a wheel. I'm just riding on the, you can't see. So it was like, I'm just riding on the, the rotor. I'll just drive in. And he drove in and he was like, lost a wheel on the radio. So we're all ready for him. And he comes around the corner and <laughs> it was like everyone, like hundreds of people just start laughing because he's dragging the fucking wheel behind the car. Yes. It was jammed up in the wheel arch, yeah. sort of sideways. Jammed, or... stuck between the brake rotor and the wheel arch. And he just dragged it. I mean, we went right through the, like, you know, right through the tire, right through the cords, right through everything. But the car was back on the ground on all four brand new tires with, with new brakes. With new brakes. Ready to go the next and, morning. And, and presumably new bolts <laughs> uh new studs for sure yes oh those um, are studs Come yeah they were studs um we were run spacers on them just to pit so we can fit and the reason it's not for extra track width it's just so we can fit uh e36 wheels on both cars because mm -hmm. both cars have e36 m3 brakes and um one is an e36 the other one's an e28 so it needs spacers um yeah no car was great we finished 11th overall which i think is pretty good considering we lost a wheel uh we got four black flags in that car one for was, motoring one was randy Randy oh. got a black flag for nothing. For excessive motoring? For contact. Hmm. And we couldn't figure out. He's like, I didn't hit anyone. And Randy knows. Randy would admit. And we're like, sure, you didn't, Randy. And then we realized there's no right-hand mirror. There's the glass in the right-hand mirror is gone. And I found it the next day. It was in the passenger, like in the footwell. Like it was in the car. He couldn't hit it. So they kissed the mirrors. No, not even a scratch on the outside. The The corner worker must have thought he hit someone. We don't know how the mirror got damaged, but like that theory is blown apart. Not a scratch on the car. So he got black flagged. And then one of the other drivers, uh, our buddy Saul, got flagged twice. And then Derek got dragged. Yeah, whatever. 11th overall in that one car. And the other one got money shifted. So that engine is... Money shifted. Yeah. <laughs> That's always fun. It happens. It happens when, we've talked about this, you grab the, the stick shift with a fist and you shift with your fist. Yeah, because you just apply amount of force to it that is the, like... The force is coming from your shoulder. You don't have fine muscle control and any feedback when you're... when you're. This is sort of a rigid joint in your elbows, especially with all this bracing on that I have. And you just fling the shifter forward. You don't have... You're not paying attention to what the shifter is telling you back. If you grab the shifter with just a couple fingers and you're moving it, you don't ever have to shift as fast as you possibly can on a racetrack. It's just not, this is not, not in this context. One. Yeah. Um, and you can watch the, the when driver you're racing for 14 hours. That's not going to make a difference. Um, I mean, it all adds up, but <laughs> yeah, but I'm not yeah. like, I'm not saying like double D yeah. clutch and then like have a coffee while you're in neutral right. and then, but yeah, you can shift at a reasonable speed. And he did, you know, red absolute red line, 7,000 RPM and fourth right back into third. <laughs> You can hear it and see the tack wrap around to pass the fuel economy numbers. Yeah, like you're like, oh, I'm getting 26 miles per gallon nope, with the nope. tachometer. <laughs> so, yeah, so that car DNF'd, but it still ran. Actually, it runs fine over two and a half thousand RPM, but uh, uh -huh. it doesn't really want to idle. And oh, that um, means maybe bent valves or definitely similar. Bent valves, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it, funny enough, it, uh, it set its fastest time of the day afterwards, which just proves. The whole thing, uh, engines run their best right before they yeah. blow up. You're like, oh, this engine's great. And then, yeah, it always, the racing engines, and they always earth-shattering kaboom. Or at least wallet-shattering kaboom. Yes. Okay. Uh, so that was the episode episode. <laughs> <laughs> we will do this. I've, I've, I've started actually engaging. I'm just making sure that we've covered everything that we agreed to talk Look about. Look at you with here. a list of things. Well, because it was such a discordant episode of about yeah. nothing that we... It was not about we, nothing. It was about our hundredth. At, yes. Look, at your age, at 100 years old, you can celebrate. <laughs> this, I will soon be there. Uh, no, this episode was representative of the of the first 100 episodes, which was to say wildly wandering and discordant and uh, not but about... full of useless and <laughs> bullshit facts that are probably wrong. Thanks, Matt. Um, about old Mercedes. <laughs> so, yes. And on that bombshell, we'll um, call number 100. We will do a P episode, right? Yeah. Someday. Yeah, Maybe 200. I might even do a P episode of Revelations. Yes. I what really, you, the, the Volkswagen Phaeton yeah. is the car to use. Yeah, I mean, I've... People or the Bugatti like, oh, Veyron. You, yeah, but I, I did... First of all, I did a, a Spotlight, which is a predecessor to Revelations when that show was at ECME, um, on the Veyron. And I think it's a great story, but I think nothing... Um, the Phaeton deserves an episode. Yeah. But now you just have to find a good one. Uh, if you are in the San Francisco Bay Area and you own a W12 Volkswagen Phaeton, please let me know because I would like to do an episode. God, there can't be many left. Yeah, people burn them. Well, even new. Nobody wanted I to. I guess I could do a V8, but that's just no fun. Yeah. What more complex F F Pieckian piece of engineering than a Q7 W12? Q7 TDI V12. But that's an actual V12. 
Yes. Like a W12 is like the most Piekian thing ever. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, that's been a preview of the Piek episode. Join us next week for number 101. What is it, Jason? Hello. Hello. Weren't you supposed to to read something? Uh, Read something. Oh, uh, yes. Um, Lucid had some Mm -hmm. stuff Mm -hmm. that they wanted us to to share. Uh, So, yes, what did they say? Let me read here. Once upon a... Oh, no, wait. Uh, Every car margin listener knows about the Lucid Air. Mm -hmm. The longest range, fastest charging luxury electric car in the world. It's designed in California, assembled in Arizona, and Jason over there on your side of the screen... Uh, has made more than a few videos about its incredible performance. What you might not know about, however, is the special lease and finance offers available on 2023 models of the Lucid Air Touring and Grand Touring. Get a new lease on electric. Visit lucidmotors.com for offer details. Uh, I think that's all I have to say on that subject. But anyway, yeah, Yeah. like we've got a sponsor. Mega exciting. Uh, Is there anything else we needed to cover? No, I think that's it. Okay, splendid. Uh, then in that case, let's get back to the uh, original uh, episode. Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, Thanks. No Thanks. Bye. Okay, see ya. <laughs>